tuning in right now. My name is Anthony Perry. I'm an interpretive specialist here at the Old Idaho State Penitentiary and one of the hosts of our podcast, Behind Gray Walls. Uh, we've got some, some questions from our, our uh, social media friends out there, so I'm going to try and answer a couple of them for you. First one, my paternal grandfather was a guard there. I wonder if you can find a record of his employment and if and where he may have lived on the penitentiary grounds. I think he may have been there in the late 40s, early 50s. So first off, if you have direct questions, you can find our website. Contact us uh, directly. Send us all the detail you have about your relative, uh, the names, the relative dates of when you think they may have worked here. Um, so that's the first thing you can do. Otherwise, there are resources online. Uh, you can access the Idaho Daily Statesman. There's a chronicle from 1860s all the way to today. If you have a Boise, Maine library card, you can log on there, do some research. If you quote their name directly, you can go through thousands of records and it'll find just the newspapers that have their name in it. So that is a huge resource, libraryofcongress.com. Also, uh, Library of Congress has their whole collection called Chronicling America and they go through and they've digitized thousands and thousands of newspapers from all across the country. So if you search there, you can find uh, more references of your, of your relative's name. Um, but our resources here at the prison, we have warden's reports. And, and for every two years, there's a, a warden's report. And for the most part, the wardens try to detail the names of the guards. There are gaps here and there, so we try to go through that. So we could find relatively uh, when this officer served and as an officer at the site through those uh, just send us an email but where would they live there there are a couple different places um, often if they lived in town they just lived in their houses but single guards would often live just across the street from the administration building uh, in the guardhouse and that was where all the single guards would live and guards that had families they often lived uh, over here on Goodman Street, there are a couple little shacks, and that's where they and their families would live. And I've actually met with a couple uh, children of correctional officers who grew up at the prison while their parents worked here. And they said that it was a regular occurrence. They would hear the, the sirens going off, and it was just a normal thing to run around, shut all the windows, lock the doors, and, and close up the ground. So uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of histories like that around here. All right, let's get to this next question. Did the guards or inmates ever yell out on the floor when COs entered the blocks? You know, not to our knowledge. There was very limited, if any, real training at this prison site. Uh, often it was training while you were on a swing shift or the, uh, the graveyard shift. They would have officers start in these shifts and they would learn every position just by filling in from day to day. Uh, oftentimes they were trained by the offenders themselves about what they're supposed to do and what time they're supposed to be doing things. So we have countless oral histories from former correctional officers talking about this. None of them have specifically said that they would yell on the floor as soon as they came in. Often they did have whistles. So that's a way that they would start, you know, coming in at 7.30 a.m. when breakfast would would start, they would blow that whistle, and all these doors would be unlocked, and the men would come out in, in streams. Um, yeah, and often these officers came from either military or police backgrounds, so uh, that's kind of where their training came uh, from but while they came here. So let's see, next question. My dad and uncle did time there in the late 40s. I have a copy of my dad's mugshot, but not my uncle's. How can I get one? So again, contact us directly. Uh, we do have access to Ancestry.com. We, as a state historical society, partnered with Ancestry.com to digitize several records, basically up to the early 1950s prison records. So we have mugshots of most of the men up into the 1950s. Those are all on Ancestry.com. If you have an account, you can access that. You can send us an email right now and we can send you uh, that information. Just make sure when you find our email addresses, you know, anthony.perry at ishs.idaho.gov, you send all the information you can so we can make sure that we have the correct person that we're sending you information about. All right. What was it like having Zach Baggins come to the penitentiary? So, Zach Baggins and Ghost Hunters, they, 
they came to the old pen, uh, what was it called, paranormal, ghost hunters, yeah, it was ghost hunters, ghost adventures, I'm sorry. So Zach Baggins and ghost adventures came before my time. I've been here for about six years. This is over 10 years ago that they came. And from all accounts, it sounds like he was very focused. He didn't interact a lot with the staff here. He was just here to catch, her, catch and rile up some, some ghosts and some spirits. Uh, but it sounds like a lot of his team were very friendly and chatted with, with all the staff here. They were uh, very encouraged. So, um, you know, we don't condone folks going up into the foothills looking for rattlesnakes. They, they are around. Uh, so that was one thing. And, and there were some problematic parts of the history that we've had to correct since that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. And uh, it kind of goes along with our n next question. More spooky stories. All of us that have worked here have had some sort of strange encounter, some strange event. And, uh, you know, one of the first earliest ones that I had was working at the front desk. And I heard footsteps upstairs. It sounded like somebody walking across the floor, but I knew I was the only person there. It just kind of made me go, uh, okay. Uh, the next time, I remember I was with my uh, podcast co-host, Sky. And I was taking her around the grounds and, and telling her some stories after a paranormal investigation. And I was telling her about a suicide that occurred where our tattoo exhibit was, where the barber shop was. And uh, after I told her about this man committing suicide there, we, it sounded like someone was throwing rocks at us. That was, we both were just like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Uh, that was pretty spooky. And then the, the latest thing that happened to me was, was last summer, I was locking up a cell house. And at 5 o'clock every day, we go through the, the site. We yell in each cell house, locking up, you know. And I go into four house, and I yell, locking up. And I hear somebody kind of shuffling along. It sounded like they were running their hands along the bar. So I'm like, locking up. Still, I'm hearing it. So I'm like, OK, I, I'm going to have to escort this person out. So I walk back. I walk into the back of the cell house. And I get to the back end. And I realize I'm the only person there. And my hair stood up. And it was, that, that, was, that one got me. I, I ran out of there. And actually, not long after that, uh, a family actually sent me an email with a photo of this spooky face. And it was right, right where my hair stood up. Like as I was looking right there, that's where this all happened. And that just, it just solidified the spooky story. So uh, those are the questions I have today. So if you guys have more questions, please send them our way. We'd love to answer them. We'll be back next Thursday for another live video.